Ruth Farmer gained recognition for her outstanding contributions to technology inclusion, receiving the Champion of Change for Technology Inclusion accolade from the White House in 2013. In 2014, she was honored with the Anita Borg Institute Social Impact ABA Award, and in 2015, she was recognized as one of the 40 over 40 women to watch in America. Notably, in 2020, amid the pandemic, she launched the Last Mile Education Fund, a remarkable initiative designed to address the specific needs of economically disadvantaged students pursuing degrees in technology and engineering fields. The Last Mile Foundation distinguishes itself by adopting a holistic approach. It doesn't solely assist students, instead, it invests in a more extensive cohort of students who have already committed themselves to careers in technology and engineering. The organization provides crucial support to help these individuals overcome challenges that are often beyond their control, guiding and nurturing them toward becoming the next generation of innovators. Join us at Tall Talks to hear more about Ruth Farmer and the incredible work of the Last Mile Foundation. really speaks to our abundance approach to how we use that to So I spent more than 30 years working on the town pipeline in STEM, since we were calling it SMET in 2001, which was really confusing to a lot of people. Glad we didn't land on that. Um, and over the course of this, launched dozens of initiatives to increase participation of young women, people of color, students with disabilities, in high demand fields, the kinds of fields where Bring your point and contribute to the world. I don't want to live in a world designed for all of us, but only made by some of us. And that's currently happening at scale now with AI. So we, we're, we find this very, very urgent to make sure that the world of technology in which we are inhabiting more and more of our lives is inclusive of the voices of everyone. So in the course of these 30 years of building pipeline programs and what I would call STEMspiration, pushing students into the system, I got to have the front, a front row seat to the lives of thousands of students, thanks to social media, and watching them going through the process. So I found a gap, and I swore I would never start an organization that didn't need to be started. I think there's too much redundancy in nonprofits, but this was a gap that nobody was paying attention to. So in 2017, Ryan, who was in the middle there, I have been watching her since she was a senior in high school, and over the course of her experience of going to college, she had parents in and out of incarceration, she just didn't have any kind of support system. Her professor and I and many other people, school counselors and others, stepped in at various times to make sure she had what she needed to keep going. And she had made it to her junior year with a degree in software engineering at Mississippi State University, had a confirmed internship at one of the biggest banks in the world, which she was going to cancel over bus fare from Mississippi to North Carolina and a place to stay. Because guess what? Internships reimburse you for travel after you get there in your first paycheck. You've got to front three weeks of moving across the country. And as Ryan, in her own words, said, you shouldn't, I was lucky. I had these women to help me. You should not have to be lucky to participate in something you have earned. And today, Ryan is a mother. She is a homeowner. She is a vice president at a big bank in cybersecurity. She's getting her master's degree. And she is co founder of the Last Mile Education Fund. So, Carol Ann. Carol Ann was one of the first students we started, we invested in during 2020. And I remember interviewing her, and she said that she realized she was three credits from finishing her degree. She had started in community college. She said, I went to an event for the food, to be honest, and they were doing things with Arduinos, and I was like, this is really cool. So she took two more classes and decided to major in computer science. She's exactly who we want in this field. She has an innate interest in technology. She was a first generation Mexican immigrant to the United States. She worked a $30,000 a year tech support job for seven years to put herself through college. And then she was three credits from graduation, facing basically homelessness because she couldn't pay her rent. And she came to us and she said, you know, I need $600 a month for three months. And we were like, of course. Today, thanks to the young woman sitting next to her, that's Priscilla in the middle and Carol Ann on the left, she is now at a major bank, making probably, by now, it's been a couple of years, over six figures. She's making more money than anyone in her family. She is out of poverty forever. But more importantly, we have her voice in the design of financial technology, which is important. 
We have the voice of someone who comes from a low income background. We have the voice of someone who comes from a Hispanic background and from a woman. All in one amazing package. And what did it cost us? A couple thousand dollars. So this is Estella, and I um, was actually at her graduation at NYU. And uh, I happened to be in New York City, and she's like, would you come to my graduation? We've funded more than 5,000 students. Can I go to every student's graduation? No. But I happened to be in New York, so I went to her graduation from NYU. And she didn't discover computer science until later in life because her high school didn't teach it. She didn't have the opportunity to get to know it. So there's this thing um, of preparatory privilege. Students who come from affluent families whose parents send them to space camp and take them to maker fairs, they show up in high school ready to go and they get encouraged into those fields. But students like her, they don't get encouraged. They kind of often get discouraged. So she got into NYU, which is no small feat in itself. Goes to NYU, but she kind of wandered around. She started in psychology, then data science, and eventually found computer science, but there was no way she was going to finish within her scholarship time if she didn't take extra classes. So she came to us and we funded those summer classes. And I'm happy to say she has an offer of $125,000 and is starting next month at a major financial corporation in New Jersey. And moreover, she is out of poverty forever. And she's going to lift up her entire first generation immigrant family because of that, that earning and that leaping into middle class. And so what did it take? In her case, $10,000. In Ryan's case, $2,000. By the time a student has gotten to their junior year in a STEM degree, society has invested $477,500 of sunk costs in terms of raising a child, K-12 schools, at a premium for STEM outreach and education, which we spend millions of dollars on. Why wouldn't we invest at this final stage, get them over the finish line and into a job? So that's what we set out to do. So, so many students are being caught up over something so silly, like a car repair, or getting sick, or a global pandemic. Something that derails them at a critical time. After the Michigan State shooting, three weeks later, I get a bunch of applications from students who are like, because of the shooting, the whole town shut down, I lost three weeks of work, and I can't pay my rent. That is how financially fragile these students are, and on average, we on average, invest $956 per student. It is so shockingly cheap at the last mile to get someone to the finish line. So, you may or may not know this, the wealthiest students in the United States receive 34% more private financial aid than the poorest. It is ridiculous. Three in five college students in 2020 reported food insecurity. And I'm not talking about I had to eat ramen and mac and cheese in college. I'm talking about I am choosing between food and transportation to school or books or tuition. And so if a young person is raising their hand and being like, I want to fill a 1.2 million engineer gap, we should do everything we can for them. We should be like the worst helicopter parents ever. Instead of asking them to do this really cognitively demanding, very important thing, becoming an engineer, in a scarcity environment, which is dumb. So what if we just invest? Rich kids graduate, poor kids don't. Maybe the issue is money. Yes, it's social networks. Yes, it's social capital. Yes, it's mentors. But the bottom line is if you don't have your basic needs met, if you don't have food, housing security, you don't have to work 40 hours a week while you're in school, you're going to do better. And you're going to graduate sooner with less debt. So. That's what we set out to do. Um, we did this in critical, one, abundantly and fast. We're agile and we're abundant. You cannot wait three months for a scholarship to respond to you when you're facing a housing crisis or transportation or food crisis. We also take an abundance approach. You don't even, we don't even ask for GPA. I do not care what your GPA is. These get degrees. If you've made it to your junior year in engineering, you need to graduate, period. The worst outcome for society is someone with two years of college debt and no degree. But the potential to be an engineer, why wouldn't we invest in them? It makes no sense not to. In fact, once they graduate, they're going to earn on average $43,375 a year more than if they don't. So the economic halo of that one graduate is lifelong and immeasurable. 
Second, we leverage the entire ecosystem. There's a whole ecosystem of organizations working on diversity and inclusion in STEM. I don't need to be everything to everybody, but I can solve their financial problems. So what we do at Last Mile, and I have a team of 14 amazing women that do this work, is we satisfy their financial crisis, get them out of the insecurity experience, and then once they're settled, then we're like, okay, what do you need to make it to the next level? And that's where our ecosystem of partners come in. Do you need mentors? Do you need training on interviewing? Do you need a better resume? And we support them in, down that road to launch them into the career that they've been working so hard to get. And finally, this is a feedback loop. Ultimately, we don't want to be the ersatz parents of low-income students for all time. We want to fix the system. And so we're getting all this data that's telling us what is happening to students. And as we're getting that data, we're taking it back to their institutions and saying, look, 80% of the students that come to us from your school are housing insecure. What can you do about that? Look, your students are facing food insecurity. Maybe you need to expand your food offerings, or leverage the SNAP program. And ultimately, long term, national, federal policy change. I was in the Obama White House. I passed federal legislation before. I'm pretty confident I can do it again. So we're working on taking this data, doing the research, building the research foundation to be able to change the systems. Because the bottom line is, higher ed was built for the sons of white landowners in the 1800s. And we have been iterating on that model for well over 100 years and thinking somehow, pushing other students into that system, that they're going to somehow be equal or somehow get the same experience when, in fact, the system is designed for the affluent to succeed. Um, this is what we've done now before. <laughs> now, before, actually, it was, I don't know, a month ago that we sent in the data, and now this is where we are. 5,132 individual students, that was as of June 30th. We're now averaging over 500 grants per month. Um, we're investing in community college students studying cybersecurity. We're investing in four-year students. We're now investing in graduate students. And as I said, $956 on average. 62% of the students who come to us for help say that they are facing food insecurity, sometimes or always. And our numbers are amazing. Guess what? Socioeconomic status is associated with underrepresented status. 42% of our students are African-American or black, 19% are Hispanic. So we are reaching the populations that every company says that they want. And I think the quotes just say it all. Like the students themselves, what they tell us about their experience. One, they say, your money solved my financial crisis, enabling me to focus on my studies. That's what we want. That's our theory of change. But the second thing they say is, the fact that you believed in me made me believe in me. Because this population of students is constantly being told, you're not good enough, you're not fast enough, you're not at the right institution, your GPA is not good enough. And we come in and say, no, absolutely. You're trying, you're striving, you are a great investment. We are here to invest in you. And they take that to heart and they carry that with them. And then the third thing that they say, which is unprompted, we just did a survey of all 5,000. Unprompted, they say, I cannot wait until I'm in a position to pay it forward to someone else like me. So we're incubating an entire generation of people who are going to give back. In fact, the first thing Estella said after she told me about getting her job, she's like, well, I know this. They're not a sponsor yet. So once I get there, I'm going to talk to them about being a last mile sponsor. So this sustainability engine comes from our alumni. So here we are today, over 1,600 graduates as of May 2023. I'll have a new number coming up in uh, December of graduates. And we follow up with them. And in fact, um, just yesterday, I got an outreach from a graduate who graduated in May. And she was kind of struggling because she hadn't found a job yet. Why? She hadn't done an internship in college. Why didn't she do an internship? She didn't know she was supposed to. She didn't know how to get one. Because even though she was at a prestigious California college, her mother had gotten divorced. So her and her brother both had to move out of the dorms and move home to live with mom so she could afford her apartment, which shook them off the campus. They're not hearing about the opportunities. They're not connecting with the career center. They're not going to the clubs and the organizations. And so guess what? She missed that window of an, of an internship. So yesterday, connected her to Estella, who's just gotten a job and is all full of hope, 
and they're both Mexican, or they're both Hispanic immigrants to the United States. I'm like, you two talk, support each other, and start building that peer network. So my call to action for, oh, I don't have another slide, okay. My call to action for you is one thing, is really think, think about how you view striving talent. I think there's tremendous value in someone who has struggled and persisted, and someone who has failed and kept going. But our system for recruiting and hiring is actually optimizing for people who've had smooth sailing. We want perfect GPAs. We want prestigious internships. We want prestigious institutions. The institution that you attended for college is much more an indicator of the zip code that your parents lived in than anything else. If you look at the top, top institutions, Stanford University has 10% of their students are eligible for Pell Grant. Over half of students in the entire United States are on free lunch right now in K-12. So you cannot tell me that somehow that shrinks to 10% when they get to applying to college. So we as a system, and I'm speaking about the technology industry, we are conflating privilege with potential. We're going, oh, they went to Harvard or Stanford, they must be amazing. We're going, oh, they won all these hackathons. Your ability to win hackathons is more correlated with your ability to not work and to take off four days, fly to another institution at your own expense, wait to get reimbursed six to eight weeks from the college group that is sponsoring the hackathon. So, being able to participate in a hackathon is a much more a function of your affluence than your ability. And then we look at things like working full time at Target to put yourself through college negatively. Students have been told, take that McDonald's manager job off your resume because that looks bad. Why would managing an entire business look bad on your resume? So as, an, as a sector, we need to really think and rethink the way we view striving talent and what their potential is. Um, my final call to action is please think about investing in students with an abundance viewpoint. We think of ourselves as VCs for low-income talent. I'm going to invest in as many low-income students as possible because every single one has an ROI of 43375 in one year. Every single one that graduates. So I can invest in 40,000 students, that, or in 40 students that don't graduate. If one graduates, the ROI in one year covers that cost. So thank you for listening, and thank you for thinking abundantly about young people who come from financially vulnerable but striving backgrounds.